Hello there. How you doing? Today I want to do a video on little hints. Nothing really may be very important, but things that um, maybe you do know already. But if you do not already know them, uh, for those of you who are relatively new at certain things, maybe this will be helpful to you. So uh, the first thing I want to uh, touch base on is, well, if you're changing your own oil, here's something you may not know, and it's a good idea to do it. When you first get your new oil filter, what you want to do stick it in the box like this so it doesn't fall over and you know that you gotta wet the ring with your finger with clean oil and on the engine you gotta make sure that that surface is very clean and what I do is I use a regular rag to clean it off to get the the worst dirt off and then I use a couple of paper towels or a very clean rag to clean the surface off that's on the engine part on this, what I do is pour a little engine oil that I'm going to be using in the engine in the filter and fill it up about halfway. It's what I call priming the oil filter. And then, of course, you know, you don't want to fill this all the way up because when you go to put it on, you're going to have some spillage. And then you're going to have a little oil, a residual oil here, so you use that just to go around here and get this wet okay and then commence to put it up in there now unless you have one of these vehicles where the filter is completely upside down like this when you go to put it on and uh, I don't think they have cars like that anymore but I think some of the older cars they used to go downward well then you can't pre-fill it most of them are just on the side of the engine like this and the reason for filling it is it's better on the engine it is better on the engine because your oil pressure doesn't come up right away when the oil filter is empty by pre-filling the oil filter even though you're not right up to the top it's easier on the engine your bearings aren't running dry with no oil pressure because you've got residual oil on the bearings but you don't want to put any more wear on it because sometimes I have seen cases where the engine, if it's old, will actually start knocking until the oil pressure comes up if the bearings are worn. So by pre-filling the oil filter like that, it, your oil pressure will come up a lot quicker because the oil filter doesn't have to be filled up with the pump pumping it through the bearings and the journals and all that stuff. And by the time it gets through the oil filter, once it gets to the oil filter, then the pressure will rise and uh, your oil light will go out or your gauge will uh, come up, whichever you have. And uh, you don't have as much engine wear but by doing this. Uh, probably you may not have known this. I have been doing that for ever since I started uh, working on cars. And as a matter of fact, I probably got that hint from uh, my friend Nate Carver, which you've seen on, other, on, on another video here that I had put up a, a short while ago. Anyways, uh, so you want to pre-fill it. And needless to say, if your filter is going up this way, in other words, the screw is on top, and you're screwing it this way and putting it in, then you can fill that oil filter up to the top and you're not going to worry about spillage if you're going on the side of the engine I would go fill it halfway but it's going to soak into the element okay so you won't get too much spillage you may get a little bit dripping out so when you spin it on and you tighten it hand tight I usually tighten it when it comes to a stop or a gentle turn and it comes to a stop give it another half a turn 
and I usually use two hands a half a turn. I don't recommend tightening it up with a wrench. You take it off with an oil filter wrench, but you do not uh, put it on with an oil filter wrench. Or if you do do that very gently, you don't want to keep cranking it and cranking it because what you'll do is you'll distort the seal and could cause a leak. And then one other thing I want to tell you about is when you take off an oil filter, okay, and your oil filter wrench does not get it off for whatever reason. Get yourself a big ass screwdriver. Drive it through the oil filter. And that will use leverage and it will pull it right off. Very rarely. I only had to do that once. But ordinarily you shouldn't have to do that. And... Um, that should uh, take care of it all, and you should have um, no problems, but just don't over-tighten it. I have seen cases where the, uh, the gasket has even stuck to the engine. And if you're not careful, after you take the oil filter off, the old one, and, you f and the seal is no longer on the oil filter, check the block, because it's going to be stuck to the block. Do not make the mistake of screwing on another filter with the old gasket still on the block if it does come off because you're going to have problems and you will have leaks. So always make sure that surface where the oil filter goes is clean and dry very thoroughly with a clean cloth and you can even put a very light on your finger film of clean oil. Don't use dirty oil. Don't use the oil from the crankcase that's in the drain pan. Always use clean oil on the surface where the filter goes and on that rubber gasket just a little bit in your finger you don't need to soak the hell out of it and after you get it on there and you go give it the half turn like I told you to take a paper towel or something and wipe all around the filter very dry underneath there so that when you do fill your crankcase naturally you put the plug in first I have heard of cases where they forgot to put the plug in <laughs> Anyways, always put the plug in and fill it up and then go underneath there when the engine's running and make sure there's no uh, pressure leaks. I usually let it run for uh, about a minute or two. Uh, after you, you start it up, but you don't give it any gas, get that oil pressure up there. Uh, let it run for about a minute or so. Uh, once that oil pressure is up there, then you can gently give it a little gas Go back underneath the car and make sure there's no leaks because the, the higher RPMs will push up the oil pressure more. And uh, if there was going to be a leak, it'll, that's where it would leak. Is any, any pressure points. A pressure point would be at the oil uh, pressure switch uh, sending unit. That's where your oil pressure would be. It would also be at the oil filter gasket area. So places like that is where the pressure is. And you want to make very sure that those places aren't leaking. We've covered that, I think, so we'll go on to our next subject. All right. This is for kind of like old technology thing here we're talking about right now. Bulk erasing cassette tapes. They do make a bigger one for VHS tapes because the VHS tapes are half inch wide. And they need the more penetrating of magnetism in order to demagnetize them. Now... When you get a cassette, which I still use from time to time, you want to demagnetize it. I'm going to show you the correct way of demagnetizing them. This is a bulk eraser. It's nothing more than an electromagnet. Got uh, iron core with wire wound around it. It's electromagnet. That's all it is. Nothing more than that. And it produces a magnetic field. Cassettes don't like magnetic fields. Any is what they call magnetic media. Okay? So any of your videotapes or cassettes, 8-tracks, whatever, are all magnetic tapes. So we're going to show you the correct way of demagnetizing using a bulk eraser. First of all, you never start the magnet near your tape because you got a strong magnetic field there and it's going to be very hard to get that out and it's going to sound you're going to have a uh, 
a noise in the tape. Excuse the cord, it's plugged into the ceiling outlet. Alright, you hold your cassette so that the magnet, magnetic field, I'm going to try to get back here so you can see. I'm starting it from here. Like this. Okay, and then you back away, still rotating. Okay, now you let go of the button. These things aren't made to be kept on too long. One minute on, five minutes off. They overheat. Okay, now what you're going to do, this is still off. You're going to turn your cassette around to the other way. All right, and you're going to repeat the process. Coming in about at least two feet or more away. Okay, that's how you do it. And you got to remember to give it that rotation. If you just come in, this is off now, if you just come in like this and go away, when you put this into the machine and you have it in play, you're going to hear... You're going to hear a, a roaring sound because some parts are magnetized. You may even hear what was already recorded on here because it didn't take it off. The rotation um, clears everything. Now if you got tape in the path here also, which we do in this case, I usually come around like this and I just give it a, you know, a quick one like that too to clean it all off. Because we reuse these tapes again, uh, like my son uses in his Tascam 414. So uh, we reuse, and this is high bias tape here, it just happens to be. And um, so we reuse them. So that's our idea now. This is the same basic principle as head demagnetizing, only that usually looks like a little uh, um, oversized mocking pen. It's a magnetic, uh, it's electromagnet also, and you do the same thing uh, staying about at least three feet away from the head in this case, and coming back and, and doing this and pulling away very slowly. That's the same principle also as it on a degaussing coil. A degaussing coil is a coil roughly the one I have up in my I had up in my workshop, I still got it, is roughly about 14 inches in diameter. The one I have is a, is a good quality one. And you do the same thing. The only difference is when you're degaussing a CRT on an old color television, which by the way is the only type of CRT that needs degaussing, is a CRT color CRT because they have the shadow mask in the, uh, before the uh, phosphor. In other words, the, the shadow mask comes first, and then you got the phosphor, and then you got the glass. Okay, so the shadow mask is what you're actually degaussing or demagnetizing. Now, on a degaussing um, coil and a, doing a color television, it's going to be coming in straight like this. Here's your TV screen. You're going to be six feet away before you turn that thing on. Do not turn it on until you, you're at least six feet away. Then you're going to come in in a circular motion like this, slowly, right up to the television screen, as close as you can get to it, go like this, and then back off. And you're going to do this slowly, and you're going to keep it on at all times. Do not shut the switch off on a degaussing coil until you're six feet away, then turn it off. But what you want to do also, before you shut it off, is to turn your degaussing coil at right angles to the screen. In other words, you're coming in like this, in a circular motion, okay? But then you're going out the same way, but when you get to the six-foot mark, then turn your gate, turn your degaussing coil this way. It doesn't apply to these. This is only for degaussing. So we kind of cover two or three different things in one subject. <laughs>